Good morning, First Methodist. Good morning. I'm Ben Wills, the Senior Associate Minister, and it is so good to be together again on this, the day after Christmas, to hear the old, old story of love come down and the baby in the manger that changed everything. As the kids in our video showed us, cutely, I might add, it is a long story, isn't it, of mud, butterflies, and merchandise, right? I've seen that video like 10 times now in preparation for the service, and I still laughed backstage with merchandise. But perhaps today, I can challenge you to leave with a fresh perspective on what the very first Christmas might have looked like. And while it doesn't involve butterflies, it might have had some mud, and I would argue it certainly wasn't all that the cute carols say that it was. I imagine that it was quite messy. So I invite you to pull out your Bibles, open the app on your phone, or direct your attention to the screens, and hear the old, old story of Christ's birth. And this morning, let me challenge you specifically to hear it as if for the very first time. So will you look with me and read along with me Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. This familiar text begins in verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Will you pray with me as we get started? Almighty God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, illumine your word this morning. Give us fresh perspective that our minds might be open to receive it, our hearts taught to love it, and our wills strengthened to obey it. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I can still remember it like it was yesterday. Dad was full of Christmas spirit as he lugged heavy box after heavy box down our attic stairs that December afternoon. Mannheim steamroller Christmas music was blaring throughout the house because in the Wills household, it is not Christmas if Mannheim steamroller music is not playing. Amen. Thank you, Dr. John. My brother, we began ripping open the storage containers to see what was inside. And before leaving the room to do some sort of pressing chore, mom instructed us very carefully to look, but to not touch. Don't take anything out until we're ready to use it. Her plan was to trim the tree and decorate the house in an orderly, logical manner, one step at a time. We had different plans. When she returned to the living room several minutes later, all the boxes were open and much of the contents were scattered all across the floor. Some of you are clearly parents and know how this goes. The room looked like a fully loaded Christmas tree had been chopped down and shaken about the room. Decorations were everywhere, and specifically, the nativity scene was all kinds of messed up. I confess this morning, I am not proud of what I'm about to tell you next, church. 
The animals took center stage since we were obsessed with camels and loved to see them at the nearby Birmingham Zoo. Preacher, the camel from Night of Lights, would have been proud. Angels, wise men, and shepherds were all strewn about as if a bomb had somehow been set off by Joseph, leaving Mary untouched. And baby Jesus, who normally would be lying in the manger with his legs and arms spread widely in the perfect position, was actually in our mind, I said I'm not proud. Y'all remember that, right? Was actually in the perfect position to have mounted the lamb and was unfortunately riding it like a cowboy. <laughs> the lamb of God skillfully riding a lamb of the world. Remember, I said I was not proud. And my mom scolded us saying, just look at this mess. And then my five-year-old brother answered, yes, but mommy, isn't it wonderful? It's a Christmas mess. Looking back on this family memory, I can't help but think about that first Christmas so long ago. Our pretty pictures and nativity sets paint this peaceful image. Mary and Joseph settling the baby Jesus, no crying he makes, into a convenient feed box lined with clean straw as a soft glow illuminates a few calm farm animals. And then shepherds drop by to worship over the newborn, followed by some passing international travelers who just happen to bring baby gifts. We know the scene. It's perfect. And if we're honest, quite frankly, a little outrageous. As someone with a two-month old at home, can I just take a second and point out how unrealistic our perfect perceptions of the first Christmas can be? Let's think for a second about what this really might have looked like. Start with a scandalous pregnancy. Mary was an unwed mother, and I'm sure the ladies of the Nazareth Junior Service League weren't really buying this talk about an immaculate conception. Then add to this scandalous pregnancy a really unpleasant journey. Unpleasant because she was late in her pregnancy. Anyone ever ridden a donkey full term? I don't see a single hand for those of you watching online. There's probably a good reason for that, I would imagine. Unpleasant because the purpose for the trip, it wasn't sightseeing or visiting. It was to go pay taxes. Then there was the indignity of having to be born in a barn. Barns then were probably only a cave, not a well-constructed structure with ventilation and sanitation. It was smelly. The animals were dangerous. Have you ever been around a donkey? They bite. They kick. They stink. And then to top things off, strangers showed up. Shepherds were considered to be some of the lowest strata of society, and yet here they were, straight out of the fields without the benefit of a shower or even a hand washing, all wanting to touch and hold the baby. Dr. Susie's here, and I know that's a no-no, right? Sorry to pick on you, Dr. Susie. That's my pediatrician. And finally, there's the whole vignette involving the wise men, this probably happened a couple years after Jesus was born. But the more important thing to remember here is their visit triggered a massacre of baby boys in the geographic area in Herod's insane attempt to keep power for himself. So to recap, the first Christmas had family scandal, an unwanted journey, a big bill due at the end, unexpected guests showing up with unexpected gifts, and ultimately infant genocide. Not exactly that perfect nativity scene sitting on our mantles, is it? Yet. But. And isn't that the best part of our faith, church? That yet, that but, 
Yet in the midst of this chaos, in the midst of this mess, a plan older than time itself began to unfold. God looked down on a world messed up by sin and knew what was needed, a Messiah. The creator himself physically entered our world through a supernatural birth of a tiny baby in a humble stable. And the miracle of Christmas happened. The God of all humankind became a newborn. Emmanuel, God with us, with you, with me, with all of us. 2,000 years have passed, but the world hasn't changed all that much, has it? Life is still messy, isn't it? To be human is to be messy, right? And no, I don't mean my two-year-old niece eating chocolate cake and somehow finding a way to get beyond that splat mat that just keeps expanding. I don't mean my office desk right now strewn with papers and who knows what else as we were frantically preparing for four services and a cantata over the last six days. I mean a different kind of messy. In each one of our personal stories, there are obstacles, things we struggle with, things that have brought us down, things that have been hard, mountains to climb, valleys to traverse. I know I've made mistakes. Have you? Life is quite frankly just messy. We all make mistakes. We all get hurt. We suffer because of others and we cause suffering for others. We seek fulfillment in things other than the only one who truly can offer it. But thankfully for you and for me, that is not where our story ends. And that's not where the Christmas story ends in that messy, stable birth. As I get older, the more and more grateful I become for the baby in the manger that came and changed everything. Jesus grew up, lived a sinless life, and then willingly suffered, died, and rose again to reconcile the sins of the world. And Christ came to redeem a broken world, and it all started on that messy night long long ago. The Christmas message is one of restoration for the entire world, for you, for me, for everyone in it. But maybe you need to hear today that God's restoration didn't stop in that manger. In the same way that he took a messy situation full of controversy and turned it into a way for himself to come to earth to be with us, Emmanuel, he now takes the controversy, scandal, and mess in our own lives and is present in those situations too. He now, in fact, takes those situations and is born into them as well. In fact, God... He still happens to be in the restoration business. Jesus was a carpenter after all. He is willing to restore, to heal all who come to him. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, or what has been done to you. In the same way that humanity couldn't solve the sin problem on its own over 2,000 years ago, today we don't have to muster the strength, the willpower, ability to free ourselves from the things that bind us, no matter what the bondage is. Whether it be hopelessness, pride, envy, depression, guilt, any of it, today, hear this, God's grace and love are stronger in the same way God entered the brokenness of humanity over 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem through the birth of a baby boy, he is still willing to enter our brokenness, to take our mess and give us freedom when we surrender ourselves to him and embrace the grace that is so freely given. See, First Methodist, the Christmas message, it's not just a cool story. It's not just the message meant for the days between Thanksgiving and December 25th. 
It's actually a message that ought to be the message of our lives. We ought to be Christmas people not just for 12 days of Christmas, but for 365 days a year. God takes what others can only see as messy, as an unsalvageable situation, and turns them into something life-giving, redeeming, and wonderful. That is the Christmas message that we should be living proof of year-round. I'm sure you know it in your head, but I wonder if you believe it in your heart. Hear for me today that God still delivers. Oh, how your friends and family. Oh, how LaGrange. Oh, how Troop County. Oh, how the world needs to hear that today and this Christmas season. Perhaps you need to hear that today. It doesn't matter how big your mess is, God is bigger, God's grace is bigger, God's love is bigger, God's redemption story is bigger. There's nothing that you can mess up that he can't forgive, heal, and restore. He is able to deliver. Direct your attention to the screens and listen to this powerful words, this powerful reminder and these words of hope from Psalm chapter 34, verses 17 through 19. Verse 17 begins, When the righteous cry out, the Lord listens. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those whose spirits are crushed. The righteous have many problems, but the Lord delivers them from every one. He delivers from every single one. Amen, church? God is too good to just deliver us and send us on our way. God doesn't just take away the mess. He transforms it. The fact is that when we experience Emmanuel, God with us, we don't just have a mess. Instead, we leave with a message. Yes, we receive a message, a lesson learned, insight, experience, and wisdom that someone else desperately needs. Thankfully, God turns the messes of our lives into something beautiful and useful in the same way he turned the messy situation that was the first Christmas on that night over 2,000 years ago. And so as we close today and I invite our worship team back up, I'm reminded that sometimes it takes the innocent wonder of a child to give us a fresh view of Christmas and to point us back toward what's really important. I think we all need the reminder that it's not all about a beautifully decorated tree, although that's nice. It's not all about an immaculate house. Thank goodness y'all can't see my house right now. It's not about hosting parties or dinners that go off without a hitch. It's not about having it all together, being spotless or living up to the expectations our neighbors set. It's not about living up to the expectations set by that perfect nativity scene that lives on our mantle. No, it's none of that that's truly important. As now we've come to the other side of Christmas, and we live into this Christmas season, I believe, and I invite you to believe with me, that we truly experience Christmas when we look past the messes in our lives, we gaze at the child in the manger, and we recognize him as the one that we call wonderful. And more importantly, I believe we truly experience Christmas when we recognize him as the one who came to transform our messy lives into wonderful messages of 
God's redemption and restoration. On that December afternoon that I told you about at the beginning of my message, Dad looked at my brother. He looked at me sitting there proudly displaying our take on the birth of our Savior, which was a mess. And in spite of the mess that we'd made of it, he had to agree with my brother. He said, yes. What a wonderful mess. A wonderful mess indeed. Our Savior today looks down on each of our lives with his message of grace, redemption, and restoration. And I can't help but think he has that same message. Yes, what a wonderful mess. A wonderful mess indeed. By his grace, may we be messages of that grace and love too. Will you pray with me? This Christmas season, God, as we celebrate the wonderful mess in that stable in Bethlehem long ago, may we celebrate the wonderful mess within our lives that we can overcome by your grace, by the gift of your Son. Lord, may we embrace the wonderful message of redemption and love. And may we proclaim it. Thank you for sending your son to change everything and turning that mess into a message of your redemption. This Christmas season, help us to focus on the things that really matter and help us to be harbingers of your hope and bringers of your peace. All this we pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.